Welcome back. I'm Austin Westfall. Live look at the Israel-Lebanon border. Militant group Hezbollah promised to retaliate against Israel after accusing it of detonating pagers across Lebanon on Tuesday, killing nine people and wounding nearly 3,000 others who included fighters and Iran's envoy to Beirut, Alone Burstein, standing by. Uh, as always, Alone, it's good to see you. Do you also uh, do a double take when you first read this headline? Uh, have you ever seen an attack of this nature before? Good to see you, Austin. Um, no, this is relatively unprecedented in the history of even counterterrorism. I mean, you know, the level of intelligence um, that goes on around the world at any given moment in order to carry out counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations. You know, if we think of even the assassination of Ayman Zawahiri, the leader of Al Qaeda, you know, what it takes to know where he is, how he is, you had drone strikes and missiles that fired into his home in Afghanistan, killing only him on the balcony. The level of intelligence that has to go in, there's intelligence going on all the time around, across all agencies in the world. And yet, something of this scale, the level of infiltration into an organization to deliver pagers, wait for them to be disseminated across thousands of different operatives, and then simultaneously detonate them. I mean, 3,000 were reportedly detonated out of seemingly 5,000 that could have been detonated, this is going to be not only a major tangible blow to Hezbollah, it is primarily also a psychological blow. This is going to cause a lot of seeming like supporters of Hezbollah within Lebanon, not necessarily operatives themselves, but people who might have gone along with it to be fearful. If the IDF or the Mossad has the capability of doing this, who knows what else they have infiltrated. So in that sense, it's a major victory for the Mossad on this day. You know, Alon, let's play this out. This is a quick little uh, video, and it's got a little bit of audio attached to it. We have, uh, yeah, and I believe this shows one of the explosions taking place. Let's watch. So it doesn't appear that it had audio, but uh, nonetheless, this gives you an idea of what we're talking about here. We also have video uh, of some of the emergency response uh, coming after these things exploded in people's pockets, in people's hands. Um, maybe this is something that's still being figured out alone, but how did Israel carry this out? We're talking about thousands of devices here. How did they do it? Do we know? There's different reports that are coming out. You know, Sky News in Arabic reported that these pagers were delivered to Hezbollah in the last several days. What we do know is that Hezbollah announced several weeks ago that in order to increase security, it was switching to these pager devices because these are one-way communications arrays. They allow, communic they allow the operatives to receive information but not send it back. That, in theory, increases the operative security because these don't have GPS tracking, right? If you can send a message back through cell networks, then your position can be tracked as opposed to these one-way trackers. So Hezbollah was starting to use these pagers recently. Sky News and Arabic reported that they received these pagers in the last several days, Hezbollah put out a different story. Hezbollah said that these pages were received as part of a larger shipment already in the first months of the war. So we're talking about, you know, at least eight months ago, the first months, not 10, 11 months ago. So that's what Hezbollah is saying. What we do, according to most reports at least, these pages originated from Taiwan. It does appear that the Mossad managed to plant very, very small explosive devices within them along the way. According to, again, different reports, I mean, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, everyone's like putting out different things. According to most reports, the explosive devices were anywhere from, you know, 28 to 56 grams. That's very small, attached to the batteries. And what we know about how the donations actually took place is that a message was sent to the pagers. According to at least the report in New York Times, the pager was, the message was, message from Hezbollah High Command. And this caused the devices to heat up. Something was triggered within all the devices that the battery heated up exponentially, and this caused the detonation. What that was aimed seemingly to achieve, and according to some reports, it did achieve, was that people would take out the pager and look at it in order to see the message, and then there would be that detonation. You know, the Al Hadith News Network, that's a Saudi news network, is reporting that upwards of 500 Hezbollah operatives have lost their eyesight in this attack. So again, if we think of technically what that is, is people taking out looking at the pager, and as a result then of that explosion, 
once again, not only is this a major tangible blow, that unto itself is a major you know, psychological crippling blow to Hezbollah operatives. Seemingly, that was the attempt, right? It was not an attempt to decapitate Hezbollah, but it was an attempt to massively incapacitate a lot of its operatives in the field, likely with, in light of this ongoing escalation. And specifically in the last week, there's been a lot of escalatory rhetoric, which is like why Israel, again, obviously Israel hasn't taken responsibility for it, but I think we can pretty much safely assume that it is Israel chose to carry this out at this moment. Yeah, and just to lay it out nice and clearly, there, there really isn't anybody else that would do something like this. That's why uh, so much has been focused on Israel in light of this. Uh, of course, um, Iran's ambassador to Lebanon was slightly injured by one of these pagers. We're talking Iran's ambassador to Lebanon alone. Uh, is Iran's ambassador to Lebanon supposed to be tied to Hezbollah? Does this implicate that he's tied to Hezbollah? Unlike a lot of other militias throughout the Middle East, Iran and Hezbollah make absolutely no secret of their connections. There is no, their connections are very public. There's lots of public photos of Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, who was, you know, photographed with the Hezbollah's, you know, sorry, with Iran's top political ranks. The, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, again, make public their activities in transferring weapons to Hezbollah. Hezbollah openly acknowledges when there is vast economic crisis in Lebanon that Iran is the one that is supplying it with fuel, the one that's supplying it with money that it then can distribute to its operatives. It publicly thanks Iran. So in that sense, we don't need this as an implication of Iran's ambassador. The fact that probably not Iran's ambassador himself, he probably didn't have a pager from Hezbollah, but that someone within his close circle had a pager from Hezbollah is not surprising if Hezbollah were to know, for example, either from its own initiative or through its intelligence, that there's about to be a massive escalation. They'd want to let Iran's ambassador know probably first and foremost um, in order to transmit the message to Iran. So that's not surprising. Um, maybe it is surprising that he was injured. I will say that it's probably not Israel's intent um, because in this case, Israel's clearly targeting um, Hezbollah operatives in the field um, and probably not seeking to create another diplomatic incident with Iran like we saw back in April that led to Iran's retaliation. Like, that that doesn't, doesn't fit with what Israel would probably want to achieve at the present moment. Um, I want to just take a moment, if it's okay with you, and like, place this within the context of the last several days in order to like, see this escalation. Because what's happened is really in the last several days, last several weeks, we have seen the situation between the sides really boiling over, starting already in July, right, with that escalation of the Misal Majd al-Shams and the IDF and the assassination of Fuad Shukr. We have then seen a lot of pressure on both sides with September starting, the fact that the school year is starting, and civil, Israeli civilians in northern Israel and Lebanese civilians in southern Lebanon not being able to start their school year. And then in the last several days, we have seen that both sides are showing indications they're ready for war. The Israeli cabinet on Monday officially voted to change the actual aims of the Israel-Hamas war to include restoring and returning Israeli civilians safely to the north. With that, they're making a major statement. For now on, the aims of the war are not just Gaza, Hamas, and returning the hostages, but also re restoring peace to the north. Similarly, a few days ago, Hezbollah put out an announcement to different villages in southern Lebanon calling people to evacuate more people, leading up to escalations. Today, the Israeli Shabak and the police arrested an attack squad of Hezbollah in Israel. According to the reports, their mission was to assassinate the former chief of staff of the IDF, Aviv Kohavi. If that would have happened, Israel would have for sure retaliated in a massive way. All sides are showing they're ready. Like Hezbollah ordering that assassination now of its attack squad indicates they're ready for the escalation. So is it going to happen now in the coming days? Is it in the coming hours, coming days? Is it not? Obviously, we don't know, but both sides in the last week at least have been really upping the ante in terms of this just ongoing back and forth, back and forth between the sides is no longer good enough, and they're ready for the next level. We'll see now what Hezbollah is going to do. Uh, yeah, and let me ask you to expand on that a little bit. I, it seems like we've been endlessly talking about the possibility that this tension between Israel and Hezbollah could boil over into an all-out war. Does this uh, attack 
stoke that type of fear? Does it seem like Israel is towing the line of packing a punch, yet avoiding too heavy a punch that might trigger something bigger? Or, or are we talking something else here? So we've often talked, you and me, about like, you know, the tacit rules of the game, right? That like you, you, like you said, you want to pack a punch, but not escalate further. This is a big escalation already. This is already Israel picking it up a notch. Um, I would say instead of actually not packing too heavy a punch, this may even be too heavy a punch. This may be Israel like slapping down Hezbollah so much that Hezbollah may actually say, like, take a couple of weeks in order to regroup before it retaliates. Because again, this is a massive communications breach. Hezbollah doesn't know. They don't know now are all their communications in danger. Has Israel been listening to everything? If they could penetrate their pages and detonate them, that means they're also listening to all their communications of every single operative. Hezbollah may take that into consideration before allowing for a major escalation right now. So it is possible that this was even too heavy a punch, so to speak, in order to lead that escalation. Another thing that's also just important to remember, and I've said this many times with regards to the ongoing hostage negotiations and things like that, internal politics end up mattering greatly. Within Israel, there's a major political upheaval going on in the last weekend with lots of reports that the Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, is about to be fired. He has very bad blood with Prime Minister Netanyahu. He's going to be replaced by Gidon Saar, someone who's now right now in the opposition. There were reports that that was going to happen in the coming hours, and all of a sudden this happened, and that's been frozen right now. But political considerations may weigh in here in terms of where Israel seeks to escalate now or possibly in a few weeks. Similar, similarly, in Lebanon, this is seen within the Lebanese government and Lebanese society also as a major attack on Lebanon. The Lebanese government itself has said that it is going to file a complaint with the United Nations about Israel's violation of sovereignty and all these things. At the same time, as a result of the mass evacuation of civilians from southern Lebanon, as a result of the inflation, Lebanon does not want a major escalation that will reduce Beirut to what Gaza looks like. So with that, both sides are also going to have to contend with internal politics as they seemingly gear up for what appears to be at this point be an inevitable, each side escalating a little bit until finally a spark leads to the explosion. But internal politics is going to weigh in also in each side's calculations. Does Hezbollah need a new form of communication now alone? Hezbollah has proven over the years to be a very, very well-organized, well-structured organization. They are very well supplied. They were instrumental in saving the regime of Assad, Bashar Assad in Syria. Um, you know, Bashar Assad was largely saved by Russia and Iran. However, he was able to survive to a large extent as a result of Hezbollah coming in and performing better than the Syrian army was performing. So in that sense, I don't think that Hezbollah lacks communications arrays. I don't think they lack experience. They don't lack very skilled people and engineers who will be able to quickly come in, change encryption codes, change all kinds of things. But again, the psychological element probably is going to play a big effect. For this to have happened, there's, there's not only a security breach within the pagers, there is human security breach here. Someone uh, within the chain of command allowed Hezbollah to be penetrated, allowed for the Mossad to come in and allow for these detonations. So with that, I think Hezbollah can compensate for this very quickly, but there's probably going to be a lot of internal purging in finding out who the traitors, who I will say it's very possible, didn't even know that they were traitors. There was a, a very, very similar style assassination that the IDF carried out in 1996. One of Hamas's chief suicide bomb-making individuals, Yahya Ayash, also assassinated when, a cell, when his cell phone exploded as he put it to his ear. According to at least what was discovered then, the person who the Mossad activated in order to give him that cell phone didn't even know that he was doing that. He thought the cell phone was just bugged. So it is very possible also that there's security breaches here that the people themselves don't even know they were part of the security breach. That's what Hezbollah is worried about, much more than finding new technology. At this point, it's probably the human factor in the security breach. We'll leave it there for now alone. Thanks for the information. As always, we always look forward to your daily YouTube uploads as well. Take care. Have a good night.